live in a world bombarded with noise. Advertising, social media, self-help initiatives, and an unending amount of information at our fingertips. With so many voices competing for our attention and attempting to direct our lives, how do we know which one to listen to? And in the midst of the noise, how do we determine the will of God? Can his voice be heard above all the others? Tune in and listen. I am just so glad you're here. Uh, I'm so excited as we kick off week two of a series we've been in called Antenna. And what we've been trying to look at in this series is how do we tune in and discover the will of God. And last week, you know, I took you over to what many of us remember watching TV on as a young child. Some of you don't know what this is. This is actual TV. It's what they, you, we used to watch on. And what was so descriptive about this TV is many of us remember that you know, the only way to pick up the signal was to use these lame antennas that they put on the TV that were supposed to pick up this magical signal that was supposed to make everything clear. It's just, it was so difficult to get these things to pick up a clear signal. Do you remember this? And in many ways, that's descriptive of how many of us think about God's will. It's like, man, maybe it's out there, but how on earth do I allow you know, my antenna in my life to pick up what he wants to say to me. And so we, you know, we try all sorts of crazy things to you know, get God to speak. I was cracking up last weekend as we were talking about this because I didn't know how many other people tried using you know, this. And based on your reaction, it was like a lot of you use this. You know, we, crank, we, we do anything, like that's gonna work, you know, and it doesn't. But I hope you took notes last week because we began to discover some things about God's will. Now, if you do take notes, and I hope everyone takes notes, I really do, but you'll notice I've been experimenting with our notes a little bit, and I'm trying to give you more space to write down what God's speaking to you specifically. So just be flexible. You know, sometimes I think we get so wrapped up in not missing a blank that we can miss God's voice into our life. So if you're kind of someone that gets worried about writing every single thing down, just write what God's speaking to you. You can always go back and watch the messages online, but just be flexible with that. Well, last week we did discover that when it comes to God's will, there's three aspects of God's will that we see all throughout scripture. And it's, it's always, anytime you see the phrase will of God or God's will, it falls into one of these three categories. I don't know if you remember this, but number one, just to review, is God's providential will. These are the things that God's gonna do no matter what. And it's really important for us to understand God's providential will because if we don't understand what God is already doing in this world, we might miss, on, miss out on the role he wants us to play in it. Now, do you remember the second aspect of God's will? Anybody remember? It's his moral will. Now, God's moral will is really, really clear. It's in scripture. These are the, his principles for right or wrong. You know, it's kind of the do's and don'ts. You know, it's kind of like, these are things you don't have to pray about. God, do you want me to lie? You know, well, no. You know, he's already been clear about that. So God's moral will. And then the last one was God's personal will. And this is the one we get really excited about, right? This is God's you know, path for your life, maybe some paths God wants for you. And this is the one where we, we said we feel all the tension. This is the one we really wanna know. God, what's your will for me? Now, the big idea that we latched onto last week was this, that if you really wanna know God's personal will in your life, and, and me too, it's always sandwiched in between his providential and moral will. I mean, there's, these are like the train tracks that you get onto if you really wanna understand and tune into God's personal will. In other words, the more you understand what God's already doing in this world, and the more you surrender to his way and his principles of living, the easier it will be for you to hear God's personal will in your life. Now that sounds awesome. It's awesome, and it's true, and it's so good right up until the moment where you have a crazy, complex situation and decision to make, it's staring you right in the face, and you're trying to think, okay, providential moral, providential moral, providential moral, and it gets really fuzzy, and it gets really cloudy, and you're just trying to think, okay, man, I, I know he said, I know Ashley said providential moral, providential moral, but I have three colleges I have to choose from, and I need to do it quick, and I don't know which one to choose. I mean, should I go to Providence or Island? I don't know, you know, what do I do? You, you, you have two job, off, two job offers, and they both seem really good, and they're both kind of equal, and you're thinking, okay, providential moral, providential moral, I don't know. 
Or you know, you, you, you have this financial decision, the bank has paperwork in front of you right now and you're going, providential moral, or you, know, you just meet that certain someone and they catch your eye and your heart skips a beat and you're thinking like, is that a sign, God? Is that providence? You know, I don't know. Isn't it fair, listen, these are the guardrails, okay? These are how you can tune into God's will. Don't miss that. But isn't it fair that there's times where you have these minds spinning, your hands are sweating, you just don't know kind of decisions, and, and you're trying to figure out how God's providential and his moral will fit in, and it's not always clear. Is that fair? And that's where some of you are. And I, I left you on a cliffhanger last week. I said, you come back, and we're gonna talk about the quickest on-ramp to hearing God's personal will in your life. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. But first, I just want you to let you know, I've been there as well. I've been there so many times in my life. I wanna uh, tell you one very vivid time that I was there. In, in my 20s, uh, two churches approached me about coming on staff, CCV and another amazing church. And as I began you know, searching and just asking God, God, which one do you want me to, to go on staff at? You know, you know what's crazy? Is I saw pros to both. I could have gone to both. They were both amazing. I mean, you know, providential, moral, these both seemed like they fit. So, so here's what I, I, I began to seek God's will in my life more than any other time. I mean, I was surrendered. I was like, God, just make it clear. And here's what I assumed. God had made it clear that he wanted me to spend my life in full-time ministry, so I assumed if he made that clear, he would make the decision between these two options just as crystal clear. Now here's the good news. God gave me the wisdom to choose the path of CCV and that's where I am today. The bad news is it was not 100% clear. It wasn't. In other words, you know, I didn't wake up in the middle of the night and, and you know, I heard this CCV. I didn't, that didn't happen, okay? <laughs> The, cl the clouds didn't part one day. You know, I wasn't driving along the freeway and saying, God, just give me a sign. And then someone cuts me off with a CCB sticker right there. You know, I mean, <laughs> didn't happen. It could have happened, but some of you refused to put a CCB sticker on the back of your car. <laughs> Do you know how many people come to church and they say, I, I say, how did you find the church? They said, I just saw all the stickers. So listen, I'm serious. That spreads the message of what God's doing here. Get a sticker. I, I didn't, I, I didn't wake up one morning and I was making pancakes. You know, I flipped the pancake over. Jamie, get in here, you're not gonna believe this. I think, I think it made out CCV. That didn't happen at all. Now let me ask you, and some of you can relate with this. God gave me the wisdom, but I didn't have definitive, 100% clarity on it. Why doesn't God always give us 100% clarity? Do you wanna know why? Because if the clouds parted and God spoke audibly on every single big decision you had, do you know what would not be required in your life and mine? Faith. And Hebrews eleven six, don't miss this, says this. And without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. So God's still gonna position us in, in areas in life where we're trying to seek his will, where he still requires us with his personal will to step out in faith. Now don't miss this. When it comes to God's providential and his moral will, okay, these are clear. But when it comes to God's personal will, sometimes God is not 100% clear. He doesn't audibly speak. But here's what I've learned from just searching scripture and my own personal experience. If you wanna write this down, I think this is a key thought. While God doesn't always show us definitively what to do, he always provides the wisdom to decide with his personal will. Now here's the question, how do you get that wisdom? How do I get that wisdom so I make sure I make wise decisions when it comes to God's personal will, that I use his providential and moral will as my guardrails, but man, there's times that it's fuzzy, how do I get the wisdom? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna give you the HOV lane to hearing I believe God's personal will in your life, it's the quickest way. If you have a Bible, I wanna invite you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. This chapter of scripture uh, just is so clear about the principle we're gonna talk about today. It's the principle I used to make the decision to come here. 
It's the principle I believe God will use in your life as well. Now, as you're turning to 1 Kings chapter 12, let me preface this by saying this. Remember last week I said this is a five-week series, and you cannot miss a week of this series. If you just came today and you heard this powerful principle and you just used this, you would have an incomplete picture of how to hear God's will in your life. This is powerful, but if you just took today, that's like riding a unicycle onto an off-road course that requires a four-wheel drive vehicle, okay? It's not the complete counsel of God on how to hear his voice, but it's powerful. Now, 1 Kings chapter 12, let me give you just a little back, background on it so we can understand it. The context is 1 and 2 Kings in the Bible are two books that are written about kings. And the very first king of Israel is Saul, He's a man that finds himself outside of God's will. He makes terrible decisions all the time, so God eventually strips the kingdom from him and gives it to a man named David. David's an incredible king. He's an amazing leader. We read a prayer of David's last week. Do you remember this? In Psalm 143, David said, teach me to do your will, for you're my God. And so David, while not a perfect person, he's continually seeking God's will and does an amazing job. David passes the kingdom on to his son Solomon, who becomes the wisest man who's ever lived. And Solomon does a great job as a leader. And in 1 Kings chapter 11, Solomon dies, and now the kingdom is positioned to be turned over to Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And that's where we pick up the story today. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse one says this. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. They intended to make him king. But before he's made king, because his dad's just died, the leaders of Israel send a delegation to Rehoboam to make a request. And here's their request, starting in verse four. They say this, hey Rehoboam, your father put a heavy yoke on us. In other words, Solomon, while as amazing of a leader as he was, he was a tough leader. He taxed the people incredibly hard because he was in building mode. And he also worked their, their hands to the bone. I mean, he was just really tough. So the leaders say, hey, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us and we will serve you. Hey, Rehoboam, put in place some new work-life balance policies. Give us a raise and we promise we will serve you the rest of, of your life. Now we gloss over verses like this and here's what we think. Well, that seems simple, just do it. Do not miss how incredibly complex this decision is for Rehoboam as a leader. Listen, when you're the leader of an organization, none of the decisions that boil up to you are ever easy. All the easy decisions get made at the lower levels of the organization. You get all the tough ones, and we do not miss how tough this decision is. Think about it this way. Solomon, everyone followed his dad Solomon. He was an incredible leader. If Rehoboam immediately, when he becomes king, goes against his father and does something different, he could be viewed as a very weak leader. And the next week, the people could come back and go, you did that, now we want X, Y, Z, and it just spirals out of control. At the same time, Rehoboam knows his father was a tough leader. He knows he worked the people hard. So if he doesn't give in to their request, there could be a rebellion on his hands. So it's an incredibly tough environment. And what Rehoboam does next We, most of us that know the story, we think he made all bad mistakes. No, don't miss this. He does something incredibly, incredibly wise. He stumbles upon the HOV lane for hearing God's word and God's voice in your life. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Here's the big idea that Rehoboam discovers. If you're taking notes, godly people are often a megaphone to hearing God's will. If you want to hear God's will in your life, God has given us each other godly people to speak into your life. And that's exactly what Rehoboam's going to stumble upon today. So what we're going to look at in this story of Rehoboam is there's three steps that you can take and I can take to hearing God's will through other godly people. And here's step one. Never rush into something. Never rush into something. Watch the very first thing Rehoboam does. This is incredibly brilliant. First Kings 12, five. Rehoboam, really, really complex. First thing he says is, hey, go away for three days and then come back to me so the people went away. He gave himself time. 
It's amazing to me how many times we break this one principle. You've been there, I've been there. We made that purchase, an impulse decision, now we regret it. We got into that financial investment because they told us you have to make the decision today or it's gone. So we said, okay. Yo, you, you started dating that person, you jumped in on that, per, you know, with that, you didn't jump on the person, okay, literally. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you jumped in into that relationship and you didn't even know them? I mean, and we wonder why we find ourselves so oftentimes in, in, in difficult situations. So here's what I want you to understand. <laughs> a hurried decision is almost, will almost always reflect your will over God's will. Do you understand this? When you hurry and rush a decision, it's almost always you telling God, God, I'm gonna go with my will instead of seeking your will in my life. So the result is, if you hurry, it's one of the quickest ways to find yourself outside of God's will. And man, we do this all the time. Parents, I would tell you one of your greatest jobs as a parent is to teach your kids this principle. I'll tell you one thing we've done in our household, okay? Uh, our kids, all three of our, our, our kids, they, they earn their own money, so they have their own money. And I don't know if your kids are like my kids, but every time they walk into a store, they have to buy something. It's like it's just there. You know, they have to get something. And so the, the, the idea of this impulse purchasing, it starts at a really young age, and sometimes we never outgrow it. So we did, we, we're, I'm observing this, so we instituted something in our house that our kids hate. If you ever see one of our kids fuming inside of a store, it's likely because we did this. Here's what we decided to do. We put in place the 24-hour rule. If, if they see something and it's the first time they've ever expressed that they'd like to buy something, we make them wait at least 24 hours before they buy it, even if they're using their own money. And man, our kids hate when we do it. They get so mad. Why are we doing it? Because we wanna pull out the emotion. You know what's amazing to me? 80% of the time, I've estimated, the next day, they come back and thank dad because they don't want it anymore. Some of you could use a 24-hour rule <laughs> in a lot of areas of life. I mean, we all can because a hurried decision, when you rush, almost always reflects you're just doing your will. You're not really seeking God's will in the matter. And here's what else I want you to know. The bigger the decision, the longer you should wait to decide. The larger the ramifications for this decision, the slower you should go. Now think with me. Why do we rush? Why don't we like waiting? Because in our minds, we have an assumption that if we wait, the opportunity will pass us by. It's backwards thinking. I've searched scripture, and I, maybe you can. I can't find one example where God's will required someone to rush a decision. So listen to me. That man or woman that makes your heart skip a beat, they are, you're not gonna lose the opportunity with them if you take your time. If it's God's will, think about this. If it's God's will, of course they'll still be there. If, if someone financially says, you have to make a decision today or it's gone, I, I would walk almost every time. If it's God's will, of course it'll still be there in the future. Don't rush a decision. I can't tell you how many times this has saved Jamie and me from making terrible, terrible decisions. But what do you do when you wait? So there you are, you're not gonna rush, you're gonna wait, what do you do? You do exactly what Rehoboam did. You seek the advice of godly people with experience. Now I would underline godly and experienced because those are your two requirements of who you're gonna ask for advice from, for God to speak into your life. Watch what Rehoboam does. First Kings chapter 12, verse six. Then the king, after he, he said, hey, give me three days, during those three days, Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. He doesn't just consult anybody, the elders would have been the most godly men in Israel at this time. And think about this, they're experienced in, in what he needs advice on. You know why? They're incredible leaders. They, they've served his dad Solomon, the wisest man in the world, for his entire lifetime. They have experience and leadership. So he goes and asks these amazing leaders, and look, look what he asks them. He says, how would you advise me to answer these people? Hey, if you were in my shoes, and since you're godly and you're experienced, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? 
he stumbles upon the quickest way to hear from God, which is godly people are often a megaphone to hearing God's will. How did he stumble upon this? Here's what I think. He heard his dad say it and do it all the time. Solomon was the wisest man on earth. If anybody didn't need to listen to advice, I mean, it's the wisest man in the entire world. And yet, this is so interesting to me, Solomon writes more about asking for advice from anyone else in the Bible, anyone else. Solomon wrote most of the wisdom literature that we have. Listen to the, the book of Proverbs, which most of it was written by Solomon. Listen to what Solomon says. I'll just give you two examples. Proverbs 10, 31. The mouth of the godly person gives what? Wise advice. If you seek godly people and ask, invite them in, you're gonna get wise advice. God's gonna be able to speak. And here's what's at stake. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors, not just one, but when you seek many godly, many experienced people, that brings what? Success, and that's what we all want. So Rehoboam, he seeks out godly experienced people. It blows me away how often I see people not do this in their life with big decisions. Let me ask you, how often do you go to godly experienced people for advice? Let, let me peel the onion back a little bit. Let's get real. The last time you purchased a home, who did you ask for their advice? Well, I asked my realtor. I asked them. Who else did you ask? Whose financial situation do you admire? And they're further down the road than you are. Who'd you ask? Most of us would have to admit we didn't ask anybody. We were afraid to ask. That was our dream home. The last time you started dating someone, who did you ask for advice before you started into that relationship? Well, I asked my friends, uh-huh. Who's been married over 15 years that you admire their marriage and you asked their input about if this was a person that you should be in a relationship with? The last big job change you made, what godly person with experience in your industry did you ask? See, for a lot of us, we don't have a problem asking for advice. We just ask all the wrong people. You know who we ask? We ask our peers. And it's like the blind leading the blind. It is. I mean, it's, it's like if you don't ask someone that's been further down the road that you wanna be down that path, how can you ever expect God to speak his words of wisdom and his will into your life? And we do this all the time. I've done this so many times. I'm guilty. Okay, I'm gonna give you one funny example. All right, I have so many examples. And I've given this example once before in the past, but it just fits so well. When I was 20 years old, I found, my, I found myself in a situation where I needed advice and I needed it bad. And if I got the right advice, it meant tens of thousands of dollars coming my way, legitimately. If I got the wrong advice, I got really nothing. So I desperately needed advice. Now, I have some video footage of, of what happened next, okay? And before I show you the video, I just need to say two things. One is, I've grown up in Arizona my whole entire life. I've seen snow maybe twice. The second thing is, I'm 20 years old, so show some grace and don't judge me, okay? <laughs> Watch this. Rod, what is the next name on your list? Well, I believe that would be Ashley Waldridge. Come on down. You're the next contestant on The Crisis, right? That was one of the most acrobatic come-ons down we, we've ever had. That was great. What are they going to bid on, fellas? It's a handy snow thrower. <laughs> this white thrower boasts a five-horsepower engine, electric start, Dixie wheels, loop handle, and a two-quart fuel tank. When you look at your list, can you see? Um, 1,200. His bid is 1200 and Chris... I don't. I can hardly watch that. It's so tough. <laughs> the good news is I hit puberty just a week after that, so it's really, really nice for me, you know. 
What, what, what you didn't see was, was we kind of fast forwarded to the end of the show. That snowblower was at the very end. Before that, I'd been on a brass telescope, a cuckoo clock, and a refrigerator. All things a 20 year old is clueless about. And then, but the person bidding right after me kept bidding $1 over me. I was getting so mad. You know, I'd bid 500, 501, I'm, I'm toast. So at the very end of the show, I'm finally the last person to bid, which is the position you wanna be in. It's finally my time to get on, and I just wanted to spin the wheel so bad, you know? And the curtains open, and there's a snowblower. <laughs> I'm clueless, I desperately need advice. And so I turned around and asked for advice from who I'd been asking advice from the whole entire show, up in the left-hand corner of the audience of a 1,000 people are my 19 and 20-year-old roommates who are just as clueless as me, so I look to them. What would you do? 1,200, that sounds good. You know what the retail price was? 579, yeah, I was double over. How stupid to ask my 19 and 20-year-old roommates. You know what I should have done? You know how I could have won the show? I would have looked in the audience and said, you, sir, right there, you look like you grew up in snow. You know, you're a little older. What would you bid on this? But no, I ask my peers. And as funny as that is, don't miss the point. We do the same thing all the time. We ask people that aren't further down the road, that don't have godly, experienced advice to pour into our lives. It's sad. Let me ask you, who struggles most with asking for godly experienced advice? I'm gonna give you a few options, you just decide. You, you choose. A, those under the age of 25. B, those under the age of 60. C, top level leaders, CEOs and executives. D, the extremely wealthy. Or E, this is a trick question, okay? <laughs> now, I'm not gonna ask you to vote, but I want you to choose one right now. Who do you think struggles the most? Asking for godly, experienced advice. I'm gonna give you my opinion. Now, this isn't a trick question, it's not. I actually think you could make an argument all four of these do. You know, when we're young, we think we have it all figured out. When we get older, well then we really think we have it all figured out. Uh, you know, top level leaders, you know, we go up and figure, you know, we, we, we're, we're a leader. Extremely wealthy, we think money is an indication that we're smart in all areas of life. My opinion, this is just my opinion, is I think that out of this group, the one who struggles the most is C, top level leaders. Listen, the, the higher you go up in the organizational life, the more you have a tendency to think you should have it all figured out and everyone should look to you for the answers and you stop listening. I believe one of the greatest traits that we need in leaders in America today and the world is leaders that will surround themselves with the right people and listen. I'm not perfect at this, but I am so committed to surrounding myself with godly, experienced leaders. Our elder board is an incredibly godly, experienced group. I've surrounded myself on my executive team and our leadership team with some of the sharpest men and women that you will meet. They're unbelievable, and I'm committed to being a leader that invites and listens. It's the only way you can be a good leader. But listen, God can speak through anybody, but I believe God speaks through one person into your life and mine, for most of us, more than anybody else. You wanna know who it is? A godly spouse. If you are married, and I know some of you aren't, so if you're not married, the alternative would be a godly parent or a godly family member, but if you're married, I believe God's biggest megaphone, how he speaks to you in your life, is a godly spouse. And some of you are thinking this, oh, they're a megaphone, all right. <laughs> yeah, they are. But don't miss this. In my life, God has used my wife, Jamie, to speak more clearly to me than anybody else. I'm gonna tell you why it's true of you and of me. Here's one reason. Your spouse knows you better than anyone. And you can't pull the wool over their eyes like you do so many other people. You can't trick them. They're gonna speak truth into your life. And secondly, they love you more than anybody else. Now, this is assuming you have a godly, Jesus-centered spouse. They're gonna love you and speak truth into your life more than anyone else, but don't, don't miss this. God can speak through anyone into your life. He can speak through a coworker 
through a neighbor, through a friend, through an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent. For some of you, if you're not in a small group, you're missing out on how God's gonna speak so clearly into your life. For me, my small group, I, I, I hear God all the time. There's godly, experienced people in there that God speaks through. God can speak through anyone because the principle is godly people are often a megaphone to hearing God's will. So, Rehoboam, he understands this. He's incredibly wise. He invites these godly people to give him advice and listen to what they tell him. They say, Rehoboam, you want our advice? Here's what we, here's what we do. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. This is a whole other message for a whole other time, but here's what they told him. Rehoboam, if you'll be a servant leader, these people will always serve you. It's incredible advice. So, of course, Rehoboam takes their godly experience advice, his kingdom is secured, and he lives happily ever after. No. What does he do instead? He does exactly what I did on that clip on Price is Right. He turns to his buddies, and he says, what do you guys think? I mean, it's the blind leading the blind, so what do you guys think? And they tell him, oh, serve the people. Forget that. Tell, go back and tell the people, you think my dad was tough? I'm going to be even tougher. And with one bad decision, the entire nation of Israel, for its history, has never been the same. Think about it this way. Imagine tomorrow, 42 of the 50 United States of America break off and form their own country. That's exactly what happened as the people rebelled. 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel broke away, formed their own nation, and years later, the country of Assyria comes, murders almost every single one of them. They're wiped off the face of the earth, never to be heard of again. One decision by one man refusing to listen to godly, experienced advice in his life. I wonder what's at stake in your life right now where you need to discern God's will. Will you invite godly, experienced men and women to speak into your life? Because godly people are a megaphone to hearing God's will. But you know what Rehoboam refused to do? He did everything right. He asked for time. He went to godly experienced people, but he forgot the third and maybe the most important part to hearing God's will into your life. And here it is. You have to swallow your pride if what you hear differs from what you want to do. Are you a person, when, when God speaks into your life through godly experienced people, can you swallow your pride if it's not what you want to do? That's sometimes the hardest part. Remember we said last week, it's not that God doesn't want to speak. It's that we so oftentimes don't want to listen. So let me ask, in what area of your life do you really need God's will? What area of your life? Is it a financial decision? Is it a family situation? Is it something with your work or with a job? The, as I was preparing this message, God just kept, he wouldn't let it off me. He impressed upon me. The area that I need to speak to some of you about right now is the area of a relationship. Some of you are married and you desperately need godly, experienced people that are further down the road of marriage than you are to speak into your life. Some of you are dating someone, or you're wondering if you should date someone, and you don't even understand what's at stake if you don't ask godly, experienced people and then swallow your pride if it's not what you wanna do. Your future's at stake. Your future kids are at stake. Everything may be at stake. So let me ask, who's one person you can seek their advice from this week? Now, you should get multiple, but who's one person that you shouldn't wait another day without inviting? You know they're godly. You know they're further down the path. You need some advice on who should you ask. Let's go back to this TV for a moment. We want the picture to be clear. I mean, we bang on this thing. God, just make it clear. Do you remember watching TV on one of these if, if this was you growing up and it was clear, it wasn't clear, it was all fuzzy, so you send someone to the TV to adjust the antennas and the moment someone 
touches the antenna, what happens? The picture all of a sudden gets clear. Now you didn't know what was going on. They let go, oh, it's bad. Oh, it's good, it's bad, it's good. You didn't know what was going on, but here's what was happening scientifically. All the signal, the electrons that were in the air, when they touched it, they became an amplifier to the signal. And this is the picture that God's giving us today of how he can speak into your life. Will you invite someone else that's godly and experienced to speak into your life? And then will you swallow your pride? I pray today that God gives you the courage to ask and then to submit to follow his will. Too much is at stake. Now listen, next week we're gonna pick up the series. I told you today this was the quickest way, I think, to hear God. Next week we're gonna talk about the clearest way to hear God. And now until then, we gave you one of these um, journals on every single seat And we want you to take these and begin using these this week to to just write down what God's telling you. Just write it down because that's a powerful way to hear from God. I I want want every single person to do that. But until then, and we're gonna pick up the series next week, I wanna end today by just making a really exciting announcement. Many of you know that uh, in July, we're opening our ninth CCV campus, uh, CCV North Phoenix, It is going to be located right off I-17 in Greenway. It's an incredible campus. If you know anyone that lives there, if you live around there, you have to be a part of this campus launch. And today, I'm really excited. I want you to help me as I announce our ninth CCV campus pastor for North Phoenix. Would you help me welcome Mike and Courtney Anderson? Mike, good job, man. Come on out. So excited for you guys, Courtney. I wanna introduce you really quickly to Mike. Mike's been our staff for six years. He's an incredible pastor, an incredible leader. Courtney and her family, uh, they have three amazing kids. Uh, Courtney and her family have been um, coming to CC for 17 years. Um, So they're gonna do an amazing job leading our North Phoenix campus. Now, today, here's what we want every person to do. If you live near there, if you know someone that lives near, near there, we want you to sign up to be able to get regular updates and to be able to get involved at that campus. So you can go to our mobile app, you can click on the North Phoenix campus and you can sign up right there or you can go to our website, ccv.church slash North Phoenix and sign up there. And uh, you know, it's gonna be really, really neat to see what God does in that part of our valley. Now if you are on our Peoria campus, our Midtown campus or our Scottsdale campus this weekend, you can go out and we have a booth set up where you can meet some of the North Phoenix staff, um, get to know them, and they'll answer any questions you have. But as we end today, I'd like us to just pray for Mike and Courtney and their entire staff and just ask God that he would go in front of us and prepare people in that area who need to hear about Jesus. They need to prepare them for what God has in store. Let's, let's pray together. God, I wanna thank you for Mike and Courtney. Thank you for just their marriage. Thank you for their kids. Thank you for the staff that's been assembled for North Phoenix. I pray that you just bless Mike's leadership and I pray you just prepare people in that area for just a movement that you wanna create with, with a new campus launch. God, we're not launching another campus just to have another building. We're doing it so we can point more people to you. And Father, as all of us walk out today, we don't wanna miss that we can hear your voice oftentimes most clearly as you speak through other people into our, into our lives. And may we latch onto you. That's, that's one of the most powerful ways you can speak. And so I pray that we would walk out today and all of us would find someone that we need to ask who's godly and experienced. And God, we just give you all the credit for what you're doing in our church right now. And we just can't wait to see how you continue to move and, and just bless North Phoenix. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're gonna pick up the antenna series next week. Until then, keep your antennas up. Bye, everybody.